Hey guys, I hope everybody's well. Still in Texas, still hot. Um, I know a lot of people are reaching out to me and asking me how I'm doing in this Texas heat, but I gotta tell you, for San Antonio, Texas, the heat still is not really at record levels. I was reading up that on an average summer, uh, there's something like 110 plus days of above 90 degrees in San Antonio also. Uh, the record for the number of days reaching above 100 in San Antonio in a year is something like 59, which I don't think we're close to yet. Uh, the summers here did not used to be this hot uh, many decades ago. It was common for there to be maybe 10 to 20, 100 degree plus days during the summer. Now that, that has certainly changed. So I'm not saying that it's not hot and I'm not saying that there isn't such a thing as climate change. But what I am saying is that at least here in Texas, we're kind of used to the heat. This is a pretty common occurrence. Anyway, I thought I would continue uh, explaining my uh, learnings from my 60s. And I, I think I'll be able to tackle three of them in this video. But again, my goal is to keep them around 10 minutes long. So uh, the one of the uh, things I've learned recently, or someone actually, a friend in a lunch conversation pointed it out to me. He goes, why is it that we call people activists like you know, you're a climate activist or you're a uh, labor activist or you're an LGBTQ activist, you're a healthcare activist. We have all of these different phrases that we use. And, uh, you know, at first I didn't get what he was saying. And, and then he said, well, why, do, why are they labeled that way, that you're active? And I said, oh yeah, I get it. Is the default human condition supposed to be inaction? In other words, is the expectation that most humans won't do anything about a perceived problem and just sort of lie there like bumps on a log, I guess? It is kind of a funny thing that if you actually take interest in the world around you, you are labeled, dare I say it, an activist. Because I think in in some circles, the word activist has uh, a bad connotation, like, com God forbid, a community activist. So that, that one's pretty self-explanatory. Not a lot of uh, context needs to be provided there. This next one, though, I think is more significant, more troubling, too. It's this idea that people that are narcissists often wrap themselves and disguise themselves in the language of innovation. So you're a narcissist, you think a heck of a lot of yourself, uh, and uh, you think your ideas are great, and you become a powerful advocate for those ideas. And it's kind of hard when you're talking to someone who's an innovator to identify, particularly from a casual relationship, whether this individual is really suffers from an exaggerated sense of self-worth, is, is a narcissist. And, you know, I think we all have self-worth. So I, uh, you know, I have trouble thinking about where the boundary line is here. I know, that, and I understand that there's a psychological or psychiatric uh, medical definition. But nevertheless, there's something exaggerated and over the top about being a narcissist. And what really brought it to mind was all the hoopla about the CEO of the company that lost the submersible, the Titan, in search of the Titanic. And he is variously being described uh, by people who knew him as a cowboy as someone who just didn't take criticism seriously, 
or uh, and, and some people actually say that he had a narcissistic personality. Uh, just my kind of amateur understanding of a narcissistic personality, uh, I don't think that they normally put themselves in positions of peril. You know, their uh, self-worth is such that they would never endanger themselves knowingly. So I think he must have believed that what his technology was doing was, was really good. Uh, but the lesson is that sometimes when people have really important new ideas, their ability to implement them successfully will be handicapped if they suffer from a narcissistic personality disorder. And, I think it's very difficult uh, because I think a lot about being a rebel at work. I've written about being a rebel at work and I, I don't think you can pursue trying to make a difference in an organization if you, you, know, if you don't have a lot of self-confidence and a lot of grit and, and resilience. You don't buckle under when the first unfavorable thing happens, but nevertheless, a cautionary tale. A narcissist can often appear as an innovator and I think create a lot of problem. And, you know, in the case of the Titan submarine, uh, death and suffering because of his exaggerated self-confidence or her exaggerated self-confidence. Uh, and then the final thing I, I, I want to talk about, and I, I, I hesitate to talk about it not really, because I like to talk, but I hesitate to talk about it because I sound like a curmudgeon. And I don't like to sound like a curmudgeon, but I, I, I've been worried about this for years, and I, I, and I know other people have written about it, that somehow the way we define our, the purpose of our existence now, it seems like being entertained is kind of what we all uh, seek. We seek entertainment. And now that has become like the highest good in the economy. Certainly one of the biggest pieces of the economy is the entertainment industry. And um, I find myself really being kind of a curmudgeon about this because I am actually bored when I'm just being entertained. I much prefer to, when I do sit to watch things, which is its own interesting phenomenon, but when I do sit to watch this, I prefer to watch things. I prefer to watch things that are, uh, that have some kind of learning uh, element to it. And, uh, you know, it, it, I, I'm just troubled by the fact that our kind of common denominator in our society these days is to be entertained. I'm, I'm slightly heartened by the fact that the kinds of things that people are turning to now, such as gaming, actually have a much more active component and involvement of the individual, so it's not passive entertainment. I think that's good, but I, I just, yeah, I, I gotta say, I really do sound like a curmudgeon when I talk about this, so I'm just gonna shut up. I thought I'd uh, mention, just in closing, why I've called my channel uh, Cosas de Osos. That's a Spanish phrase that my grandmother used to use. It's an idiomatic expression. It translates literally into things that bears do. I'm Puerto Rican. My grandmother was born in Puerto Rico. There are no bears in Puerto Rico. There never have been, to the best of my knowledge. And she would use that phrase to talk about kind of nutty things that happened. So when something kind of nutty happened, a little bit crazy, not criminally crazy, but just kind of a little bit crazy, she would say, esas son cosas de osos. That's something a bear would do or bears would do. And, you know, was always really interested in where the heck does that phrase come from? And I, it must be an old Spanish phrase because there are bears in Spain, or at least there were. I imagine there still are some. 
and uh, the kind of animal of Madrid, the capital of Spain, is a bear. So must must come from there, but you know, that's where that comes from, Cosas de Osos. And I, uh, I named the channel that way in honor of my grandmother. And because I think it kind of reflects a lot of what I want to bring, which is to uh, bring out unusual uh, things uh, to light. So thank you for listening, particularly if you're still listening. And I'll talk to you again soon.